Hi everyone, uh, as we promised in December, we are back with a third episode of Join the Bot. As you might know by now, Cynthia, Morgan, Fiona and myself, Maria, we are all PhD students in GMIT and we are working on marine mammals in Irish waters. We had our last webinar before the Christmas break when our speakers, Karim, uh, Tom and Son, talk about the use of drones in cetacean research. Remember that you can still watch past episodes on our YouTube channel. So today's webinar uh, will be all about seals. And um, we will have different examples of research studies conducted on pinniped species in the UK and Ireland with a very diverse range of techniques. So we are very excited to introduce our speakers. First, uh, we will have Dr. Samantha Cox, uh, we, uh, who is a marine ecologist based at University College Cork. Her work focuses on understanding the behaviors and distributions of marine mammals and seabirds to assess how these animals interact with and or are impacted by anthropogenic activities and environmental change, with a aim to improve conservation management. She is currently employed under the EU Interact project, Sea Monitor, where she is investigating post-release movement and space use by, by rehabilitated harbor seals around Irish waters. Then we will have Isi Langley, a PhD student at the Sea Mama Research Unit and the University of St. Andrews. She is investigating the population level effects of competition and predation between seal species around the UK. And we will also have Laura Oyer. She is also a PhD student and she, she is in Albert Day University and also collaborates with uh, the Sea Mama Research Unit as well. Her research focuses on gray seals, blower physiology. And then we'll have one more speaker, which is Maria, who just introduced everyone else. Uh, Maria Perez Tadeo, she's a PhD student at the Galway Marine Institute of Technology. She's also a member of Join the Pod, as you can see. And her research focuses on the population assessment of gray and harbor seals on the west coast of Ireland through a combination of non-invasive methods such as behavior, acoustic and drone techniques. So the outcomes of our research will be used to provide policy advice and help Ireland meet legislative obligation in relation to the conservation and management of these species. So that's for today's plan. Four great talks lined up. Uh, please remember that you can post your questions in the chat during the webinar and we will ask them live uh, at the end. Um, and then I think that's it. Without further ado, I think we can watch the first uh, presentation uh, by Sam. It's on the post-release diving and space used by very rehabilitated seals in uh, across the Irish Sea. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Dr. Sam Cox, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher based at the University College Cork. And today I'm going to talk to you about some work we've been doing under the EU Interact funded Sea Monitor project, focused on monitoring diving and space use by rehabilitated harbour seals across the Irish Sea. So seal rehabilitation is widespread globally, particularly across North America and Europe. And seals might enter these programmes for a variety of reasons. For example, they might be abandoned um, at haul out sites or on the beach because of human disturbance, causing mothers to, to leave pups. Um, they might be victim of dog attacks, um, causing injuries that require treatment. Or they might simply be underweight or have weaning issues due to disease or um, a lack of adequate feeding. The goal of seal rehabilitation programmes is to have seals that are released back into the wild that are healthy, able to survive independently and eventually go on to successfully reproduce. However, despite the common existence of these programmes, post-release monitoring is challenging and rare and relatively little known, is about, known about the behaviours, movements and survival of rehabilitated individuals when they return to the wild. And so under the Sea Monitor project, we're using GPS GSM biologging technology to track the post-release behaviours and movements of juvenile harbour seals that have been rehabilitated at Explorer Seal Sanctuary in Porto Ferry in Northern Ireland. And so between November 2019 and July 2021, 17 rehabilitated seals were fitted with devices and released back into the wild. 
and the aim of the work is to first investigate behavioural development post-release and how long individuals survive for, and second, assess movements and space use as they adapt to life in the world. So a brief overview of the tag that we use, um, it's called a GPS GSM phone tag and we attach it to the back of the seal's head um, just prior to release from the seal sanctuary. And tags generally stay on until the seal molts, which um, happens annually, or in the case of younger seals that are growing, may be more frequent. The tag is um, capable of recording and relaying data via a number of sensors. So first, it has a GSM antenna, which communicates with the mobile phone network and allows us to get data in near real time whenever a seal is within range of the mobile phone network. It has a fast lock GPS, which records the location every 10 to 15 minutes, a wet dry sensor, which tells us when the seal is in the water or hold down, a pressure sensor, which allows us to measure the depth that the seal dives to, um, a battery that provides generally between four and six months of logging and transmissions, and finally an optional accelerometer, which we can either turn on or off. And when this is on, it can assess prey catch attempts by seals and also the swimming effort they move to move through the water. However, um, having the accelerometer turns on reduces the battery life by about two thirds to um, around two months. So during, um, during our study, um, as I mentioned, we tracked 17 seals, nine females and eight males, and 16 out of 17 of the individuals were less than a year old when they were released. Five of the tags towards the end of the study um, had the accelerometer logging component turned on. And so this figure just gives you a brief overview of the tags, um, the individuals that we tagged and how long they were tracked for. So we, um, we got tracks of between one and six months long. This figure just shows the proportion of tags still transmitting um, with time since release. And so um, it's a proportion of all tags in green, the dive only tags in blue, and then those tags that had the accelerometer activated in red. And so we can see that around 65% of the dive only tags were transmitting for at least 12 weeks. And, if, and with of these, 65% um, a further five tags, so 30% overall, transmitted for three or four months. Of the accelerometer tags, we didn't get such long transmissions because of the decrease in battery, but we did manage to still get 60% of the tags transmitting for at least eight weeks. And the longest track seal was around 28 weeks. So to look at the behavioral development, we decided to concentrate on four indices. We looked at daily distances traveled, dive depths, dive durations and prey capture attempts. So we found that when we looked at the, um, the daily distances traveled, so the dark gray um, line in this says the median of those 17 individuals, and then we have the 75% interquartiles in darker gray, and then in lighter gray, the 95%. And so we see that um, almost all individuals are rapidly able to cover daily distances exceeding 50 kilometers and are at least traveling around 25 kilometers each day, suggesting that they've got um, good movement ability. We found that um, seals were able to immediately dive to depths of around 25 to 30 meters and that um, the maximum dive depth across our deployment was about 150 meters and that these deeper dive depths occurred when the seals moved further offshore into deeper water. So on the left, we just have plotted the maximum dive depth against the maximum bathymetry. And on the right, we have the maximum bathymetry with days since release. And we can see that the dive depth and the bathymetry are very well correlated. And if we then look at our dive depth with days since departure, we see that it follows a similar trend to the bathymetry, suggesting that it's not ability that limits how deep the seals dive, but it's the, um, the habitat that they're in. And it does seem like they're capable of being able to explore the entire water column as they need, almost immediately following release. The dive durations um, range from about two to six minutes with a maximum duration of 10 minutes. And it looked like they were able to dive um, to these levels as soon as they were released. And these kind of figures are in line with um, reports we have of rehabilitated and wild sealed pups tracked off the Californian coast. 
um, suggesting that that's what we would expect. Across the five seals that we fitted with the devices that record accelerometry, um, we could identify prey catch attempts when um, seals made jerky head movements. So it would suggest that seals are um, trying to catch something. So it's not necessarily indicative that they were successful, but they're at least encountering things that they're trying to catch. And interestingly, we found here that in the first few days following release, um, they weren't making many of these jerky head movements. So it didn't seem like they were attempting to catch food. Um, but as time went on, there was a steady increase in their um, total number of prey catch attempts. And within um, three to five days of release, all the seals were making regular um, he jerky head movements associated with prey catch attempts. So we wanted to try and also have a look a bit at survival and assess, um, can, we, can we tell um, how many of the individuals are surviving and how many are dying? Unfortunately, because we only have one tag on the individual when it stops working, we don't know if that tag stopped working because it fell off the individual, the battery failed or that the individual died. However, we did get some information for some of the seals. So for three seals, um, two of them, Ariel and Mills, ended up back in rehabilitation centres um, with severe lungworm infections and ended up needing to be euthanised. And a further seal, Holby, um, was also found dead on a beach um, on the east coast of Ireland. So we know that those three seals ended up dead. We had another seal, Baloo, who was re-rescued after one month of release. And at that point, he had lost around half his body weight. So he was about 20 kilos and he'd also lost his tag. And he went back into the rehabilitation program and was later released, um, but not, not with a tag that time. And then there was a further three seals that we suspected died based on short trap lengths and their end of trap behavior. So the first of these was Pip, Pip which is on the left. Um, Pip had a reduced dive ability towards the end of his track. Um, his dive durations decreased quite a bit, but he also started to use a large amount of effort to swim through the water column. So he was one of the pups that we put an accelerometer on. On the, on the top right, we also have Marida, who we think probably suffered a mortality um, towards the end of her deployment, um, which was quite short. It was only a month in length. Um, she started to make much shallower dives and much shorter dives. So that suggests a decreased dive ability. And then we also had Hope, who's shown in the bottom right, who also was a very short deployment length. Um, so only a couple weeks. And whilst we can't rule out that this was maybe just a failure of the tag, um, her dive ability was much reduced compared to other individuals at that point in their trip. And so this maybe could be related to that. So um, in summary of survival, we had seven out of 17 of our seals were either known or suspected um, dead or rescued, which is about 41%. We had 65% of our tags um, transmit for at least 12 weeks. So we know that 65% that of seals lasted at least that long. And a further 30% um, lasted um, beyond 14 weeks, so beyond three or four months. And these estimates are kind of are in line with what we've um, what we know from studies up around North Scotland and Orkney, where survival in um, one year old pups is around 40%. Elsewhere, it's a bit higher, but there's a lot of um, annual variability in these figures. So finally, um, where did the seals go? So the seals that we tracked um, displayed a high amount of variability in their behaviour and movement patterns. Um, seven seals made these extensive trips across the Irish Sea to Scotland, England and Wales or around the coast to Wexford, Donegal and Galway. And other seals on, um, remained in the coastal waters off Eastern Ireland. We found that um, seals that were released um, in the autumn, so that was um, in the months of September, October, November, tended to make much bigger trips compared to those that were released um, in December, January and February. Um, and based on observations from previously tracked adults, um, these exploratory movements were much more extensive than we expected. Um, generally, um, so if you look at the figure on the right there, it shows on um, tracked studies of adult harbour seals, and we can see that they just they don't do these huge trips, they tend to stay quite local. And so it was quite surprising that the juveniles made these massive trips. Um, but it's not, um, un it's not completely unexpected because studies on from Western North America have also found similar patterns that juveniles make much bigger trips than adults. And that it appears that rehabilitated seals may be making 
bigger trips than, than seals that have remained in the wild. And this might be related to knowledge that they gain from their mothers that our rehabilitated seals would be missing. Um, high use areas that we identified were on the waters um, just off the east coast of Ireland, around Stranford Loch, Dundrum Bay and Carlingford Loch. And um, these areas of high use also corresponded to areas where um, the seals that we had accelerometers on were making more dives and also um, more prey catch attempts. So it suggests that they are spending more time in areas where they're finding food. And these areas um, are aligned with those um, that are known um, kind of seal hotspots from tracking studies on adults. So the two figures on the right show maps um, based on a recent report um, in the UK um, on harbour seal mapping. And we see that our kind of concentration of harbour seal tracks is aligned with where we find adult seals on the east coast of Ireland and also where we have haul out areas. So in summary, um, we tracked 17 rehabilitated juvenile seals between November 2019 and July 2021. The most common reasons juveniles needed rehabilitating were abandonment and dog attacks, both of which are linked to human disturbance at haul out sites and beaches. Individual tracking periods range from one month to over six months. And we found that um, post-release, seals adapted very quickly to life in the wild. They were able to travel um, daily distances of 25 kilometers, dive regularly to around 30 meters deep and for durations of uh, 10 minutes. And within a week of release, all five seals that we tracked using accelerometry were making regular jerky head movements associated with prey capture attempts. Four of the seals um, that we tracked were known to have died or needed rescuing and a further three we suspected um, died. 65% of the seals survived until at least three months. So we know that they are surviving for a decent period of time after the rehabilitation program and that they are able to adapt to life in the wild. In terms of where they went, there was an extensive exploratory behavior that's not generally seen in adults and four seals traveled over 300 kilometers from the release site. Space use was concentrated in the waters off the central and northeast coast of Ireland in areas where adult harbor seals are known to frequent. And so together, these results suggest that following release from rehabilitation programs, seals do adapt quickly to life in the wild. However, large, large exploratory trips that were bigger than expected suggest that juveniles may encounter a wider variety of threats than adults, and management plans should account for this. Thanks very much for listening, and um, just a nod to our funders. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions in the question and answer session. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, Sam, for this great talk. It's really interesting to see that the young seals are what they are up to, at least after they are released. It's really interesting. A bit sad to see that quite a few of them have died, but definitely really useful to know this kind of information and probably it must be really nice for the rehabilitation centers as well to have that kind of feedback. Uh, on this, uh, okay, first don't forget to type your questions in. We see that some are already coming in, so that's great. Uh, so yeah, don't hesitate with that and our speakers will be with us at the end of the webinar. Uh, on this, we are going to jump straight into Izzy's talk, presenting the SMRU Seal Pred project, a new citizen science project investigating the prevalence of grey seal predation of marine mammals. Good luck, Izzy. SMRU Seal Pred is a new citizen science project led by the Sea Mammal Research Unit at the University of St Andrews. We're enlisting the help of members of the public to report observations that may be related to grey seal inflicted deaths of marine mammals. For a number of years we've been aware that some individual male grey seals kill and feed on marine mammals, uh, specifically grey seals, harbour seals and harbour porpoises. This behaviour has been widely observed, but we don't yet know how many individuals are involved and how often it occurs. So we're hoping that reports submitted via our new web page will contribute to our growing knowledge of this behaviour and give us a better understanding into its prevalence throughout the Northeast Atlantic. So for this talk today, I'm going to start by giving a brief background into what we know about seal predation of marine mammals. 
I'm then going to present a case study from the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme, which provided a huge amount of information into the injuries that can be caused by grey seals, and also helped to resolve many historic cases within the Strandings database. Now, for seal predation to be reported to the stranding schemes, there has to be a carcass recovered. So for this next part of the talk, I want to highlight what information we can gain just from observing behaviour in the wild. Um, and here I'll provide some examples of seal predation observations that have been submitted by members of the public to the project. And to conclude, I'll just give an overview about what we hope to achieve from the data that we've collected. And at this stage, I want to give a bit of a warning. Um, I'm going to be sharing some images and videos which people might find gory and upsetting. Um, the intention is not to shock, um, but hopefully to give you an idea of what to look out for and um, highlight the value in capturing this behaviour on camera. Seal predation, so the killing and subsequent feeding of marine mammals, is not a new phenomenon around the world. For example, stellar sea lions in the southeast Alaska, southeast Alaska have been reported killing and feeding on young harbour seals. And in Peru, South American sea lions frequently predate South American fur seal pups at breeding colonies. Leopard seals in the Southern Ocean are also believed to predate the young of a number of seal species, including Antarctic fur seals, Southern elephant seals and crab eater seals. So despite marine mammal predation being widespread in seal species, it doesn't appear to be a common trait within populations. People have attempted to explain what drives this behaviour, which tends to only be observed in adult males. So in fur seal and sea lion populations, where males defend and mate with a group of females during the breeding season, predation of pups has been suggested to be a defensive and territorial behaviour. However, across all seal species, most cases involve the consumption of at least part of the prey animal, which would suggest young animals provide opportunistic feeding for breeding males. It's also been suggested that this type of behaviour is more common in populations which have recently colonised new areas or populations that have recently increased in size, and it could in fact be temporary state until an equilibrium is re-established. So for this talk, I'm going to be focusing in on the Northeast Atlantic. So around the UK, Ireland and the continental Europe, we have two endemic species of seals, the grey seals shown here at the back and the harbour or common seals shown at the front. So in general, grey seals are larger than harbour seals. And although the two species can be seen hauled out at the same sites around the coast, harbour seals tend to remain more coastal and grey seals tend to further travel further offshore. They also breed at different times of year with harbour seals breeding in the summer months and grey seals in the autumn winter months. So in Europe, the first confirmed observation of grey seal predation on a harbour seal was observed at a colony in Germany in 2013. A year later, an adult male grey seal was observed killing and partially consuming multiple weaned grey seal pups at the Isle of May breeding colony in southeast Scotland. Luckily for us, the carcasses of many of these pups were collected and analysed by the Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme. And this enabled the stranding scheme to confidently describe in detail the pathology of carcasses killed by grey seal predation. This then led to a reanalysis of historic unexplained cases dating as far back as 1985, and many cases in the strandings record were resolved. And it is also now understood that grey seal predation in Europe is not limited to just seals, but also harbour porpoises. So analysis of the pup carcasses collected from the Isle of May in 2014 provided a wealth of information on the injuries that can be caused by seal predation. The most common morphological features of seal carcasses attributed to grey seal predation include teeth or claw rake marks in the fatty blubber layer, undermining of this blubber, canine puncture wounds to the skull, and the characteristic spiral cuts previously described as corkscrew lesions. So seal and porpoise strandings are assessed for grey seal predation as the cause of death and are scored on a scale from definite to unlikely based on whether the entire interaction was witnessed and whether other causes of death are also plausible. So this figure shows the counts of grey seals in blue and harbour seals in red around the coastline of Ireland surveyed by aerial thermal imaging between 2017 and 2018 with the size of the circle representing the number of individuals counted. 
Johnny Woodlock from the Irish Seal Sanctuary, along with others, have been collecting information about seal carcasses discovered with predation-like injuries. As with the general dis distribution of grain harbour seals, reports of these potential predation events are widespread and not limited to a specific region. So this information collected, expertly analysed and made available by the volunteer groups and stranding schemes gives us an invaluable insight into the causes of death of marine mammals that wash up on our shores. However, what happens when an animal dies and its carcass is not recovered? So until recently, there was no formal collection of, in of this information, which includes witness accounts of possible grey seal predation. So smooth seal pred provides an opportunity for anyone who has witnessed grey seal behaviour that may be linked to marine mammal predation to report this information via an online form. So we're asking for both a description of the event, as well as any images or videos that were taken at the time. And although the reporting page is new, we're also keen to receive historic reports. So in the following few slides, I'm going to give you an example of some reports that have been submitted um, and highlight the information we can learn. So first up, we have this report from a grey seal breeding colony on the east coast of England. So from this single image, we can see that the perpetrator is an adult male grey seal and his unique pelage pattern is captured, which means that we should be able to recognise him again if we see him in the future. This next report was from just a few weeks ago in southeast Scotland. Again, here we have some great shots of the adult male grey seal's pelage, including some scarring around his nose. And this time the victim looks more like a small harbour seal, although we are still hoping that this carcass may be recovered so that we can be certain of this. This is a similar report from the same region in southeast Scotland from a few years ago. This is an adult male grey seal pursuing, killing and then feeding on a weaned grey seal pup. And this is an example of a definite grey seal predation event as the entire interaction was captured. This drone footage from the same region um, was actually only from a few weeks later and through photo ID we've been able to match this individual grey seal. So over a two, two week period a few years ago this individual grey seal felt fed on at least two weaned grey seal pups. This is a report from Wales and this time a grey seal was observed feeding on a harbour porpoise. So this seal wasn't actually seen catching the animal, so we can't rule out scavenging. And finally, I just wanted to highlight this report from the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group, in case any of you missed it. In November last year, they had the first report of a grey seal feeding on a harbour porpoise in Irish waters. So the video is really worth a watch, so maybe we can share a link to that in the chat. So what can we learn from these observations? So the first thing we're interested in is the number of grey seal predation events that are observed. So by increasing the number of eyes looking out for this behaviour around the coastlines, we'll get a better understanding of how many events are missed from the strandings data alone. By combining these two data sets, we'll get a better understanding into the frequency and ge geographic range of this behaviour. And this is particularly useful to understand whether the level of predation in different regional populations is sufficient to significantly influence their population trends. So we're also interested in photographs of grey seals involved. So we can identify individuals from their natural markings and can begin to build up a catalogue of known marine mammal predators. So from this, we'll gain a better understanding into whether this is an opportunistic feeding strategy by males across populations, or whether only a subset of the population has specialised in feeding on mammals. Additional descriptions, photos and video evidence are also useful for us to learn more about this behaviour. And finally, we hope to be able to estimate the number of grey seal, harbour seal and harbour porpoise mortalities caused by grey seal predation and calculate the significance of these on regional populations. So this is particularly pertinent for harbour seal populations on the north and east coast of Scotland, which have suffered dramatic declines over the past 20 years. So I'd just like to end by thanking the organisers of the Join the Pod podcast um, for inviting me to give this talk today. And I'd also like to acknowledge that this is a hugely collaborative project spanning multiple universities, research groups, strandings networks and volunteer organisations in the UK, Ireland and continental Europe. This project is part of my PhD and I'd like to thank my wonderful supervisors and also the Super DTP for funding the project. And last but not least, I'd like to thank, thank all the contributors to Smooth Seal Pred, both 
um, those who've already contributed and hopefully any of you in the audience who would like to get involved in the future. Thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Izzy. This is a very interesting project. Uh, instead of looking at the time frame of your observations, it seems that this predation event they had been a bit overlooked in the past. So yeah, it's really nice seeing the question explored a bit more thanks to people's observation. Uh, I think you mentioned it during your talk, but yeah, if you could post the link in the chat so that people can report the observation, that would be great. Uh, on this up next, we have Laura uh, asking a question. Gray seals, the fatter the better. Well, let's find out. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Olia, and I'm a PhD student at Aberdeen University in collaboration of uh, Smruins and Andrews. And I'm here to talk about uh, my PhD project and what I am I researching. So my interests are on gray seal blubber, which is the subcutaneous layer of fat, and how this changes with weight gain and loss, and what are the implications of these changes of fat percentage in blubber function. Blubber is very important for marine mammals. It has a role in the insulation, buoyancy, energy storage, and it is an endocrine organ, and it has an impact in feeding success and juvenile survival. It has been seen that pups who are fatter, they are more likely to survive. And hence my title, the fatter the better. However, seals are not equally fat during their life. They have rapid changes on their body composition, and that is because of the spatial and temporal uh, separation of reproduction and feeding. Females come offshore um, to have the pups, and during three weeks they are going to produce high fat milk for the pups while they are on land and therefore they are not able to feed. During this time they are going to lose a lot of weight while the pups they have these three weeks of um, high fat milk that they are going to triple their size. After that those three weeks the mom returns to the sea to feed while the pups remain on land for another up to a month that they are going to be fasting and losing part of the weight they uh, gain during the three weeks before they can go back into the sea and learn how to get their first fish. So here are some examples of what happens during the breeding season uh, to give you an idea of these uh, the masses that they can have and uh, the changes. On the right hand side you have the pups, while on the left hand side you have their mothers. And the data is taken five days after the pup is born, or 15 days after the pup is born. And you can see that moms, they can decline about 20% of their body mass during these 10 days, while pups can increase it up to 70%. So seals have large storage of fat, and they change these um, energy stores quite quickly. And imagine that during these 10 days that you've just seen data, you tripled your size uh, as a human, you have a lot of problems to cope with this change on your body. And actually we know that for humans, rapid increased weight um, has complications that they can lead to diabetes or cardiovascular diseases. So how do seals cope with weight changes? What we know from biomedical research is that the serious comorbidities such as diabetes or cardiovascular diseases that are associated with unhealthy fat stores are linked to an increase of fat cell size, changes in oxygen availability, mostly a reduction of it, although there is some conflicting data in human um, um, studies, there is an increase in inflammation and increase in oxidative stress. However, for gray seals, we don't know anything about those, those factors. Oxygen availability has been pointed out as the trigger to inflammation and oxidative stress, and the first word did I decided to start on my PhD. 
So for the first study that I did in my PhD, I studied this research question, do gray seals maintain adequate oxygenation in blubber during fat tissue expansion? And this research project was published in August in Physiological Reports, where you can find all the details of this study. However, I'm going to highlight the main findings just. So here is how I started investigating how seals cope with weight changes. I measured the oxygen levels in blubber of 12 juvenile gray seals that they were in a weight gain uh, trajectory. These seals had a range of different mass that I could associate with different um, oxygen levels. For four of those animals, I was able to resample them five months later after they gained more weight and compare the initial uh, measurements with the second measurements. I first collected some uh, morphometric data like mass, girth, length and the blubber thickness which I measured with an ultrasound and you can see in the right top corner indicated by the white arrow. Then I also took measurements uh, related to the oxygen delivery to the blubber, such as the breathing pattern, the systemic blood saturation, and the hemoglobin in the tissue and the oxygenated hemoglobin to make sure that while I was sampling, there were no uh, major differences in the oxygen delivery. And then I inserted the oxygen probe in the blubber with the help of the ultrasound to know that actually it was within the blubber. And I took readings for about between 30 seconds and two minutes. What in the literature, there is some evidence that uh, blubber depth is a factor to take into account for blubber composition and for oxygen consumption in gray seals. And therefore, I wanted to take different measurements at different blubber depths. So here you have an example of how did I um, do the sampling. So the, you have the skin on the top and the muscle on the, on the bottom of what it could be the blubber depth. And first I, um, I put the, uh, the probe at the bottom near the muscle, took the reading, then retracted the probe a bit further up, took a second reading and then a third reading near the skin. So how it could look like the measurements that I got, you have the oxygen in the y-axis, in the vertical axis, and time in the horizontal axis. And here's where we inserted the proof, the measurements of oxygen are atmospheric, and then it declines over time until it stabilizes and here in the box is what I consider stable reading, and that's the one that I used for my study. Then here I retracted the probe to the second position in the middle of the blubber. I left it a few seconds to stabilize, and I took a second measurement and then a third measurement for the outer. As you can see in this example, measurements are very similar, and actually I didn't find any difference between the between depths on my measurements. So when I pulled the data together and I compared to what I found in the literature review for humans and rodents that they were lean or with um, obesity, is that the range of oxygen levels that I found, they are within the range that they found in other species. However, I don't know what that means for seals. We cannot infer if these lower levels prevent the tissue from, from functioning normally or if it's um, enough for them. What I did find though is that the oxygen availability is reduced with increased fatness. So we can see on the plot on the left hand side, again, we have oxygen on the uh, vertical axis and in this case we have fatness on the horizontal axis. And we can see a strong and negatively association between oxygen and fatness. So the fatter the animals are, the less oxygen they have in their blubber. And for the four animals that we repeated the samples, the sampling we can see that before they gain mass, uh, 
um, oxygen levels were higher than after gain of mass, there is a reduction about 37%. However, these results were not significant. So coming back to our research question, do gray seals maintain adequate oxygenation in blubber during fat tissue expansion? No, there is a clear decline on oxygen levels, but we don't know what these um, reduced oxygenation means for seals yet. We don't know if they have um, implications further down or if when seals are in different life stage, for example, during the breeding season when pups increase their size um, so quickly, if they will have the same levels of oxygenation or it could go further down. To summary my study, um, we know that adequate oxygenation is a challenge for fatter gray seals. So hypoxia is not only a challenge while they are diving, but while they are fattening. There might be downstream molecular implications of reduced oxygenation, but we still don't know that. And actually, that's what my next steps are for my PhD, where I'm going to analyze the epoxy molecular markers, molec uh, metabolic pathways, inflammatory pathways, and oxidative stress to try to understand better what implications this reduced um, oxygen level that I'm seeing might have on seals' uh, life. So there is still a lot to do. And just to finish, I would like to thank you for listening to me. I hope that this talk was interesting. Thanks to my supervisor for their support, my funding body and over the university, my collaborators at SMU. Thank you very much. Wow, thanks, Laura. Uh, I, I really like uh, Laura's talk because like, I think it's very overwhelming for probably a lot of us because, at least for myself, I'm not uh, doing any kind of molecular biology and all of this. It's very far away. So always I'm very impressed by how accessible you make it. So it's really nice and it's very good to have something different like this. So it's really nice. We're lucky to have you all this episode with different things it's great and yeah it looks like a lot of things ahead of you for your phd um it being your domain of expertise i guess it looks even more scary for me but <laughs> sure you will do great and looking forward to hear more about this because it's not something we're used to so much but it's really interesting so thanks for that laura uh, okay finally our last talk of today's webinar is going to be from maria so Maria is going to present her research on the disturbances due to drones on harbour seal colonies from Galway Bay uh, in the west of Ireland. Good luck, Maria. Hi everyone, I'm Maria and I'm a PhD student at GMIT and I'm working under the supervision of Dr. Joan O'Brien and Dr. Martin Gamel. Today I'm going to talk about a study we conducted in order to assess disturbances due to the use of drones into um, harbor seal colonies located in Galway Bay. And I'm going to talk also about the uh, recommendations that we provide. As we all know, during recent years, there has been a significant increase in the use of drones in marine mammal research and monitoring studies. Although this technology presents advantages in data collection against traditional methods, its potential impacts on marine mammals have raised concerns within the scientific community as these potential impacts remain largely unknown. So apart from being accessible and affordable for wildlife research and for monitoring populations, drone, uh, drones are also a less invasive alternative to power aircraft monitoring and to different techniques involve, involving capturing or interacting with individuals. Also, the use of drones facilitates replication and um, collection of large amounts of data in a short period of time. But on the other hand, research studies aim at assessing potential impacts of the use of drone technology on different species and the implementation of empirical-based regulations to mitigate su uh, such impacts are not being carried out at the same pace 
at uh, which these devices are being integrated into marine mammal research and monitoring studies. Applications of drones in marine mammal research carried out today primarily involve species monitoring. Drones uh, have also proved to be suitable for assessing body condition using photo photogrammetry, uh, also for photo identification to detect, for example, anthropogenic impacts such as entanglements, um, also for collecting low samples to assess cetaceans health and uh, to record behavioral data. Most studies assessing how pinniped species react to drones have a reported an increase in vigilance behavior and individuals splashing into the water. Just a few uh, studies reported low or no impacts on the behavior of pinnipeds. There is evidence that different species of marine mammals so different degrees of reaction to the presence of drones uh, when these are visually or acoustically detected. Therefore, there is a need for studies that assess the impacts of disturbances uh, due to the use of drones at the species level in order to devise and implement a specific and suitable regulation uh, to mitigate these impacts. In this case, uh, in this study, we focus on the harbor seal, which is included under Annex 2 of the European Union Habitats Directive, and this means that this is a protected species. So the aim of the, of the study was to identify disturbance uh, thresholds in drone flying altitude for harbor seals and to devise recommendations on best practice to be implemented, implemented in future research to minimize disturbance on harbor seals. This study was conducted on two harbor seal colonies in Gold Bay along the West Irish coast um, these were Castle Bay and Tawen Island. In green, in the map on the left, uh, we can see the limits of the Gowe Bay Complex, a special area of conservation where Tawen Island is located. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we collected the data. No? So drone operations were conducted during the daylight hours, of course, and they, uh, most of the recordings were conducted two hours either side of peak low tide and this was because we were expecting a higher amount of seals to be hauled out at this time so it was easier for us to spot the groups of seals. After arriving at the sites we also recorded different um, environmental parameters because we wanted to include different environmental factors in the subsequent analysis. Um, so the field work was conducted by a two-person team. Um, the pilot and the behavioral recorder. And in this case, the pilot was Sean O'Callaghan, who gave a very good talk um, on the last webinar as well. So the general approach here was that the drone was flown vertically to a height of 100 meters and then moved horizontally um, until it was positioned above the selected group of seals. The drone pilot <coughs> then carried out a controlled vertical descent of 5 or 10 meters at a time at a constant speed in order to minimize changes in noise uh, due to changes in speed and direction as well. So the drone was allowed to hover for a duration of 1 meter at, it, at each fixed altitude. So we started uh, flying the drone at 100 meters and the drone will stay there for a minute, then descend to 90 meters and the drone will stay there for another minute and so on. So sub subsequently, the drone was flown vertically back to 100 meters and then uh, was brought back to the vantage point. So the behavior of the selected group of seals were record was recorded from land by scan sampling using a telescope or a high zoom digital camera, <coughs> depending on how far uh, the group was, um, every five minutes, um, for a total of 30 minutes before and after the flight and also at every minute during, during flights. So this is every time the drone was placed at, uh, at each new height above the group of seals. So seal behavior was recorded before, during and after all drone approaches. So these are some of our results. No? So in the first graph we have how vigilance behavior changes with drone altitude um, so on average, the highest proportion of harbor seals vigilant was recorded when the drone was um, 
between 20 and uh, 10 meters, so here. And um, we found the lowest proportion of seals be lands before and after drone uh, approaches. So we go now um, to resting behavior. So this is this graph. And um, conversely, the highest average proportion of harbor seals uh, resting was recorded before and after drone approaches. And we found the lowest proportion of seals um, resting between uh, 20 and 10 meters. And finally here, so we have in this graph a locomotion together with flashing behavior. And we found uh, the highest proportion of seals moving and entering the water at 70 and 40 and also 10 meters. And um, I think it's important to mention as well that the slight decrease in vigilance behavior observed here at 10 meters corresponds with an increase in locomotion. So it doesn't mean that the seals react lower, no, they are less vigilant, but it means that they saw uh, in an even higher response at lower altitudes. We carry out experimental drone approaches over two different harbor seal colonies located in Gower Bay to identify disturbance thresholds and express as flying altitude for these species. So we found that seals saw a significant behavioral response to the presence of drones, with this a response being even higher with, with the drone um, flying at lower altitudes. The presence of a drone trigger an increase in the proportion of seals vigilant uh, displaying locomotion and flashing behaviors, and therefore a decrease in resting behaviors. Um, I think it's important to mention as well that, like all pinnipeds, harbor seals spend a considerable part of their lives ashore, returning to the same uh, howled site. So um, they gather there to rest, breathe, uh, nurse, mold, and thermoregulate. So this characteristic makes them even more vulnerable to um, anthropogenic disturbances caused by the use of drones, as this could interrupt crucial halal uh, behavior such as resting and nursing, for example. We recommend that drone approaches in future research studies working on harbor seals should be kept to a minimum flight altitude of uh, 30 meters over the animals. Also, abrupt uh, changes in altitude and direction should be avoided, as this could affect noise levels made, made by, the, by the drone. Um, additionally, we uh, recommend conducting trials at higher altitudes for different research studies in order to identify potential reactions in the individuals and assess whether the required methodology could work at even higher um, altitudes for each study. And finally, uh, we think that a further assessment of the potential adverse effects um, caused by the, the use of drones on pinnipeds, but also in, in other marine mammal species in general, must be carried out in order to fill the, um, the knowledge gap uh, needed to devise best practices regarding drone operations in light of the increasing use of these devices in marine mammal uh, research. So finally, I have included here some comments about our study that I think they are important to mention. So first, um, the seal groups were uh, selected when there were no pubs in the vicinity in order to minimize disturbances. And this study was conducted outside the breeding season. And this means that our results are limited to the reaction observed in adult harbor seals. Each selected group of seals was approached only once during a field work day to minimize unnecessary disturbances and also to avoid potential habituation or sensitization. Drone approaches were conducted in a vertical direction over the seals, descending at a constant speed and therefore uh, minimizing changes in noise levels. So taking all this into account, um, a precautionary approach may, must be applied in future studies. Also, the drone used during this study was a DJI Phantom Pro 4 Pro, 
So this drone type is expected to be one of the most commonly used by marine scientists, but also by civilian operations could be widely applied. And uh, finally, the required licenses to carry out his research study were issued by the National Parks and Wildlife Service prior to field work started. And um, drone operations were conducted following uh, national regulations. So this was possible thanks to the National Parks and Wildlife Service for providing the license required to carry out this research project. Thanks also to Dr. Ian O'Connor and Sono Callahan who participated in this study and thank you all for listening. I will leave you the references at the end of this presentation. Thank you, Maria. That was great. And it's definitely important to us as this kind of stress. Uh, I think drones are, I use more and more in research. We saw that last time already, but I think also a lot of people uh, use them as well recreationally and that might, they might not always be aware of the potential effect of, uh, on wildlife. So definitely important to get this out there. Uh, I think this concludes a very great series of talks. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sam, Izzy, Laura, Maria. Uh, for participating in that episode. Um, we, or I, mean, I speak for myself, but I think it's true for my neighbor here as well, that we know more about SEALS research than we did before. Yes. <laughs> uh, and it was very nice, like some very nice and varied examples uh, on how can this can participate and, and help a bit towards our conservation as well. So I think now we're going to take questions. I've seen a few of them passing in the chat. I um, don't know if you have questions how or you want to, to have. Okay. Ask some of them. Uh, I don't know. Wait. Let's start from the beginning, maybe, yes. <laughs> before we get confused. Oh, yeah. Well, we had some questions and Sam answered them, but uh, in case you would like to say something extra, Sam. Uh, Rhiannon, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it right, asked, um, said, hey, Samantha, thanks for the talk. It's super interesting. Were the seals held in isolation in, her, in rehabilitation? And then asked, do you think social enclosures such, such as are used in Germany and the Netherlands will affect their behavioral development after release and possible success rates? Um, I don't know if you want to summarize, Sam, what you said or add more onto it. Yeah, no, I can I can summarize. So, um, yeah, basically, um, when they go into the Explorer Seal Sanctuary, um, they get assessed by a vet, and I think at that point, if they have a disease, they'll be put into isolation. But generally, they go into these individual pens, which are kind of lined up next to each other, so they are on their own at that point, and they. And in the pool, um, they're with other seals generally. And then when they get um, adequate, like when they're happy with how they're feeding in, in the pool, it's kind of a mini pool, maybe like five, five or eight meters by about a meter depth. They then move them to a much larger pool that's I think about five meters deep and just a lot bigger. And in there, um, they feed them by kind of putting dead fish, I think, in the water. And the seals kind of need to compete a little bit to feed also with the seagulls, as far as I'm aware. And then when they get to a certain weight, they release them. So they are kind of in social enclosures there. Um, so we don't have any information on individuals that weren't to compare to individuals that were. Um, I mean, it's and with the sample size, I don't know if it's something we'd be able to really tease out even looking at like the time they spent in the pen before they went into the, the large enclosure. I'm not sure if the center have taken a note on that. Um, there was one seal that was quite isolated, which was Baloo, who came in and there were a lot of problems with him feeding. So he ended up staying in for a long time and then COVID happened. So then he couldn't be released and he ended up for, I think he was in the rehabilitation center for nearly a year, whereas they wouldn't normally be in for that long. But the COVID restrictions, I think they couldn't, mm -hmm. they couldn't release him or something at, at a certain point. So then when they finally did, I think he'd been on his own for a few months and he didn't do that well at sea. He was rescued, but I don't know if that's related to that or if it's just, I mean, he wasn't the strongest seal when he came in anyway. And he took a long time to go through the, the rehab process. So, yeah, I can't really answer that, but 
that's that where we're at. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for all the details. Um, and, uh, we had a follow up question on this, or maybe I can we can ask questions to every speaker. And yeah. Then we, uh, well, we can go for that one. Uh, so the next one is for Laura from Iris. Iris. She asks uh, about the decrease in O2 stored in the blubber and how it might affect, affect seals. Can we consider a possible increase in myoglobin instead? Hi, thanks for the question. Um, myo uh, myoglobin is generally stored in the muscle and it might help with the diving behavior of the, of the seals. But in the context of fat expansion, probably it doesn't uh, compensate the reduced PO2 that we are seeing and the consequence that they might have in inflammation in the adipose tissue itself. So I haven't measured if there is an, an increase in myoglobin and I haven't seen any study that has, but I don't think that that could affect this part of my study. Okay, we had a weird internet thing. I hope it went through, I'm not sure. Is it still frozen? Mm -hmm. No, it's back. Okay. it's back again. So we all hope you could hear the answer to that to the last question. Yeah. It's a bit frozen on our Sorry screen. But, um, so thanks, Laura, for the answer. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. If you want, I'll, I'll repeat. If not, or I'll write it down. Yeah, maybe you can write it down. Yeah, just in case. I have no idea if it went through or not. It was. It seemed frozen on the live, but. The team's meeting was working fine, so we didn't realize at first. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think the next question I have here is for Easy. Yeah. Uh, Heather right. is asking, regarding the predation encountered, are there any links between fishing activity or usual prey species decline? Yeah, um, it's a good good question. Um, I guess seal prey. Availability can vary for lots of different reasons, including overfishing, but also things like climate change um, and regime shifts. Um, I would say that I think the important thing in terms of the predation question is that it's not likely that seals are shifting towards a, mam a mammalian prey because there is an absence of um, other prey species, as is it isn't actually seen that widespread in populations. Um, it seems like it's more, I mean, grey seals are opportunistic predators, and so it's, it's more likely that they are just seeing this as a, as a potential, like an opportunistic prey source, just to um, top up their kind of, um, yeah, top up their food. Um, but we, it's still early days, we don't really know, understand that much about the behaviour. So, yeah, it was a good question. I suppose there must be some kind of interest in like the prey it is because it must be quite hard to catch another seal or, or let alone a porpoise. Yeah. Like during your presentation, we we're asking ourselves with Cynthia, like, how can they catch a porpoise? <laughs> but then this I suppose is, yeah. it must be quite energetic then to make up for it. I mean, one of the things that would be really, you know, would answer so many questions that we've still got is, you know, if we're able to catch uh, any of this kind of on video tags or even yeah. like underwater, like it's really hard to imagine to picture a grey seal catching even a healthy uh, like young animal any yeah. kind of seal species especially uh, any kind of porpoise so yeah, yeah. Right. so yeah. I mean they have looked at the carcasses and it doesn't appear to be just kind of unwell animals but yeah I mean it would be amazing to actually actually the, the Irish whale and dolphin group video as much as it you can't really tell from the video itself. The person who submitted the video did see the entire interaction, um, but obviously so much of it is underwater that, yeah, even yeah. that is limited. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, if they, given how hard it is to see a purpose when you go at sea, <laughs> like, they are very good if they can catch them. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, one for Maria, I guess. That's um, right. Yeah, we have a question for Maria as well. Uh, Sue is saying, uh, I guess a drone impact will vary according to multiple factors as well as the manufacturer too. Recommendations should only apply to the type of drone you used or uh, do you recommend precaution? I think. Yeah, I don't know if it's... Uh, yeah, I suppose the question is like, would you... Yeah. Like, even though 
there would be some different impacts depending on the drone uh, device you use. Would you still recommend precaution and just consider that it will have an impact? So be careful. Oh, Maria, I think you're muted. I was. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, definitely. There are many other factors that affect the drone disturbances. No, So we took into account different factors, environmental factors, but also others like, for example, the group size, you know, how many seals were in the group. So we did took into account those. But the, yeah, I had to just put this in, team, in 10 minutes. So I just focused on the most important thing that we thought it was like the altitude. No, for the drone, but there are definitely other factors that can, uh, yeah, affect the um, affect the no how the the drone ca causes disturbance. And one that is very important, uh, we think, is wind speed. No, uh, because the wind can mask the the noise that is perceived by the seals. So wind would be an important one, but also, for example, background ambient noise levels would be really important as well because of the same. No, it, it could mask the drone, the the noise produced by the drone. And yeah, at the end, in the last slide, I, I did I did say that we in this in this study we use a DJI uh, Phantom 4 Pro. So this drone is quite a. Um, it's very used not only in research but also for like civil operate operators. So I think the our recommendations could be widely applied. And also, yeah, many things have to be taken into consideration here. For example, we only focus on the um, outside the breeding season. No, we all we only assess disturbances in adult sales. So that's why uh, we also highlighted there that a, pre a precautionary approach should be applied. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, I do you have questions? I'm sure I, we saw the questions yeah. during and then I forgot. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, I had the follow-up questions for Sam because you, you answered to me in the chat saying that some of the seals were recited. Uh, I think it's interesting we see them again and I suppose it must like also like kind of uh, induce some interest from the public as well because not every day they see a seal with a tag on its head so have you been able to like interact a bit with people or explain what you are doing? Yeah so I had um, one person cited a seal that they they were out sea swimming in the in the Stratford Loch and they saw a seal with a tag on it so um so they they emailed. I think they emailed Dara, and Dara put them in contact with me, um, and that was quite nice. I sent them some of the tracks of the seal just to show them what I'd been up with. Um, we also had another one sighted up in near Derry on the coast um, of Northern Ireland um, by a kid who uh, I think the seal was hauled hold out, and he was worried the seal was going to get cold. Um, oh. so he'd been staying with the seal for a few hours, and he was also worried a dog was going to come and attack it. Um, <laughs> Fair, fair enough concern so um yeah that was quite sweet and um that was actually one of the seals that ended up going going back into rehab and that we um well that ended up being rescued and that we think had a lungworm infection so um i kind of had to email him back eventually being like oh yeah that seal didn't do so well in the end but um he yeah. um it was nice to interact and generally like when people have emailed in i, I try and send them like a little that's a nice. little summary of what the seal's up to from the data. It is nice to get interest. Um, yeah. And it's yeah. really useful for us to hear that they are being cited just to confirm that they're all right. I think a couple of people had sent us photos of, um, I think the, the the one where the kid had seen it up on Northern Ireland, they sent us some photos because they were worried the seal wasn't in good condition, but then we could assess from the photos that he looked okay at that point. Um, mm. So that was useful as well to get that information. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. It's an uh, like additional monitoring tool, I suppose. Yeah, it's nice. And I was wondering, like, just mentioned, like, yeah, quite some of the seals got sick and like lung infection. And I know it's super hard to like uh, determine, probably. But do you think they could be that because they don't, they spend a few months out of the wild, that like their immune system is weaker, or could it be because they were weak in the first place that they had to go to rehab anyway? So. Yeah, so I think most of the seals that we had in this study came into rehab because um, like during COVID, there were a lot more people on the beaches and I think most of it was people disturbing them. So mm. I don't think they were necessarily weak seals to begin okay. with. I think more that the rehab center is dealing with 
seals that are getting disturbed by people on beaches that would have been okay if they hadn't have been disturbed, um, maybe. So, like, if people crowd around the seal, the mother won't come back. And so then if the mother doesn't come back after a certain period of time, the the mm. um, seal sanctuary consider that seal abandoned and they'll take it in. They usually, uh, explorers, they usually like to wait, I think, a day to, to give the mother a chance to come back. Um, and if she doesn't, then they will take the mm -hmm. seal in. Um, but it is, I think there was more than half of our seals were just um, people crowding around. And then we had a few that were dog attacks. So um, I think there was one dog attack that was so bad that the seal had to be euthanized. But for three of them, they managed to recover. Um, in one case, I think it was the same dog on two on two of the seals. But it, oh, just, wow. it was quite frequent then. So those ones, I mean, they come back up to a good condition. So I'm not sure they're necessarily like weaker, weaker seals. Um, Longworm, I think, is a, an issue across like all the seals that in the center they get wormed um, okay. and they get wormed I think just before they're released and also when they come in so I've been wondering that if the worming is cleaning them out too much that they're not building up a resilience to the ones but I don't have any information to mm -hmm. like yes. I don't have any information on if that could be the case or not. Um, mm. I suppose it's difficult to compare if you cannot have the wild seals to check mm -hmm. the difference. Yeah, sometimes so. Sometimes I wonder with longworm if it's just a bit of a lottery, like if they get it at the right moment when they can deal with the infection, they manage to go on okay. But if they get it when they're maybe just learning to forage or something, it, it just takes over too quickly. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Uh, can I do one for Easy? Yeah, yeah Easy, um, actually, like we were wondering, like how, um, how can you tell the difference between like uh, an injury that was induced by uh, a bottlenose dolphin or another seal? Like, are they very different or? Um, yeah, it's a good question again. I think basically there was a lot of work done in the Murray Thirst on um, dolphin, bottlenose dolphin attacks on porpoises. And so they got quite a lot of data on that as well. And generally the kind of the way that you can distinguish them is that they actually match the kind of tooth uh, rake marks mm -hmm. either from a bottlenose dolphin skull or from a seal skull and in terms of the predation I suppose the other injuries uh, bottlenose dolphin tends to be kind of multiple fracture wounds and, and kind of internal kind of um, organ damage tissue damage um, whereas the seal predation because it's uh, also kind of this undermining of this blubber layer and they, they remove the eat part of the blubber. Um, and also the kind of the lacerations tend to start around the head. You get these kind of puncture wounds from the canines and then uh, the kind of corkscrew spiral lacerations kind of go around the body and um, down from the head. So, yeah, there are some similarities, but these uh, people who yeah, post mortem the animals, are, they've got so much information about both that they're able to distinguish the two. OK, that's interesting. Um, do we have to wait? Uh, I think there was something else, but I don't remember now. Uh, do you get uh, a question? That, if you also have questions for each other, uh, yeah, feel that's free to one. ask. Yeah? That's what I wanted mm. to say, actually. I had one from Maria, but I forgot. <laughs> we'll come back. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, yeah, no, it was rebounding on what Sam said with the the people like being there on the beach and disturbing them and so on like did you maria witness that a lot uh in your colonies like people know, there were people disturbance in seals you mean yeah like, like yeah. did you when you sampled did you have a lot of people around for example to close or so no for example for this study you know we focus this in go bay and um i think we sample in February and September and in those colonies there weren't people around but I did one of my other chapters was focused on the Blasket Islands no and uh, so the place is becoming more uh, very popular for tourists and so there are a few yeah quite a a, a lot la, of yeah tourist vessels approaching um during the the summer season no? the tourist season and also the um yeah that just tourists can go in even in in the beach 
and disturb the seals. So many times you will see that people go arrive from the beach and uh, all the seals have to enter the water. So yeah, yeah. It, ha it has happened. Yeah, it has. Of course. Isn't that one of your chapters actually? Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, one of the chapters is focused on the impacts of the um, ecotourism you know, in the behavior of the gray seals in this colony. So the Blasket Islands is, yeah, it has a, one of the biggest colonies in, in Ireland actually. And yeah, so as I said, the place is becoming really popular now because it's, it's really beautiful there, but there are no enough or there are no regulations in place that can yeah regulate uh, where tourists can go and where it cannot and how far the vessels approach. So I think it is and it's important, yeah. Have you found a threshold distance when the vessels are approaching the seals that are causing them to then go into the water? If, if we found, sorry. Uh, like a threshold distance, have you found a distance that you think is triggering the seals to go into so, the So the seals, so the vessels now, they approach up to 100 meters. I think the recommendations we suggested stay as far. I think the, the, the place where the vessels arrive, I think it is as far as 300 meters, like not just right on the beach, but on a side, you no, know, in the island. So that's where the vessels approach. And that, yeah, if the vessel also, an important factor there would be the speed at which the vessels approach as well. So yeah, 200 meters, that's okay. But then we found, well, while doing the study, we found that the vessels would pass really quickly, just yes, 100 meters of the colony, even less. Mm -hmm. So there is a big impact there, yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, um, yeah. For everyone in general, like if you are interested in knowing more, like uh, all our speakers, of course, like are part of bigger projects and they give presentations on most of the time only an aspect of a broader project they work on. So if you have more questions to them or if you would like to, I don't know, read their papers and so on, like just use this as a platform for that as well. Like feel free to reach out and like mm -hmm. in the chat, ask more info and like if you can read their papers or whatever for, it's always also nice for that. Um, yeah, I have a question for Laura. So apologies if the question is a bit like uh, not well framed because it's really not my area of expertise as well, but I think it's super interesting. So if I got your talk right, you were saying that uh, um, you didn't. You still observed a reduced oxygenation, right, uh, in seals. And so I was wondering if you had any example, maybe in other species, where it wouldn't be the case, or in other species that it was proven that get the fatter the better. Do you have any other example of other species? Because I think you still need to look at the metabolic pathways, but has it been done somewhere else? So for regarding the oxygen itself. In some studies in humans, they actually found an increase of partial pressure of oxygen in fat tissue okay. with increased fatness. Uh, while in other animal, all other other animals, they reduced the oxygen, and most other studies in humans also reduced the oxygen. But in some studies of humans, it increases. Okay. So that's a bit of conflicting, and that's why I also chose to try and see what was happening. Um, but I didn't find any other evidence. There is not many studies in wildlife animals mm -hmm. approaching this question from yeah. the point of view of the tissue itself and mm -hmm. how it reacts to uh, the tissue expansion. Mm. Yeah, from yeah. from their life cycle and life history, it seems that they're pretty well adapted of getting fat and lean all the time. But yeah. It would be yeah, interesting exactly. to find out how they do that. Yeah. yeah, and how they cope with the differences, yeah. because what I found till now is that they actually have constrictions with this fat expansion. So maybe they have other mechanisms that they contract these detrimental effects of having low oxygen levels. Really interesting. Yeah, it's really cool as well. Mm -hmm. It's so different. Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, do, do we have... I didn't see more questions, but just so you know, girls, we have like thanks coming in the chat as well, because we don't read them, but there. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Uh -huh. It's really interesting. Yeah, it was great. So, yeah, that was cool. Can um, I can I say something really quickly? So mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Samantha, I think you asked the question no, about the limit that we recommended for the vessels approaching. I just checked really quickly. So we said to 250 meters okay. maximum and also reducing the, the speed while approaching the colony. Mm -hmm. right. so, another thing I wanted to ask quick was, um, do you have any information on how long the seals stay in the water before they then go back out following a disturbance from a vessel? Not really. All what I can say is about observations because I've been there for a few days now. So usually after disturbance, seals will be will leave the beach for a few hours. Definitely, okay. maybe if they, yeah. For example, yeah, these are just observations to say no. So if the disturbances are around 4 p.m. <clears throat> or something like that, so you wouldn't. Some days you wouldn't find seals back in the beach until 8, 9 p.m. If there are no disturbances since the last, since the last, then, yeah. Okay, thanks. That's quite a long For time. A, a few hours, yeah. Yeah, it's well, it's But I think also depends on how big the disturbance were, was no, if there were like different disturbances at the same time or not. So it depends on that as well, yeah. As Cynthia said, the study is published, so you can. Yeah. Maybe we can put the, we can put yeah. the link maybe in the chat and yeah. if there's someone just asking Maria please you can uh, please can you confirm what the 250 meters advice applies to so it's vessel approaching you said yeah we wrote these recommendations with vessels passing along the colony yeah most of them were tourists but yeah like ferries saying that they continue. should stay at least 250 meters away from the colony, right? That's that's what we recommended. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's also for that. If we have policy makers and so on listening, uh, it's mm. a nice way for you guys to come forward with those findings that are very very important. Um, yeah, I think Morgan is putting up the link of the study of Maria. So if anyone wants to know more about it, um, yeah. Uh, what else? Would I, I had something else, but it's still, it's still not coming back to me. It's OK. Yeah, um, yeah it's OK. Fine then. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you if well, we don't have any more questions from the audience, but if you still want to jump in to ask questions to each other, go ahead. No, we're OK. No. Then I think we can we can close, close yeah. Um, OK, so yeah, we hope uh, you all have enjoyed today's webinar. Uh, so remember that we will uh, be back every month now. So I think it's the last Friday of each month with more interesting topics and also great speakers. Uh, next month, we will be talking about potential impacts of renewable energy devices on marine mammals. So don't miss it. And we also wanted to say that if you would like to share your work um, <clears throat> as part of a future episode, you can reach out to us and we can discuss about this. And yeah, thank you all for listening and thank you for, yeah, thank to all the speakers. And thank we'll you see so you. much. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, thank everyone. You. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.